So to continue our tour of science, we've kind of reached Darwin and Wallace. Darwin wrote this famous book, wrote a bunch of other stuff, and he proposed this theory, which we'll call the Darwin-Wallace theory. But at the time, it's a hypothesis, right? Because we haven't promoted it to a theory yet, because we um, haven't tested predictions. There's a pattern and a process, right? Evolution occurred, things are related, the process is natural selection, and the big conceptual shift is from a typological approach to a variational approach. And this theory presented a new explanation for homologies, right? So remember homology, these are things that are similar because of descent instead of similarity due to current function. So it was known that there was a lot of things that were similar and it didn't really make sense that they were similar. So you look at these um, forelimbs and you see that they all have basically the same arrangement of bones even though they're doing very different things. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. Prior to uh, evolution, there were ideas that maybe they're similar because of some sort of developmental pathway that had to be followed, or that's just the way it is because that's the way it is. But an evolutionary process provides an explanation for homologies, and that's actually one of the major accomplishments of this initial proposed evolutionary theory. And it reinterprets this whole change over time, right? This is Lamarck's model where we acquire a ladder by things changing over time for different amounts of time. The Darwin-Wallace theory is different. There's no more ladder, right? Life starts way back here in the past and changes as it comes through time. Things split off from each other. So these two things are similar to each other because they have a common ancestor here. These two things are similar to each other because they have a common ancestor here. And they have to go back in time to get the common ancestor here. So these guys will look similar. These guys will look similar. But maybe these guys evolve differently so they look like they're lower on the ladder, but they're not really on the ladder. There's no such thing as a ladder. Everything alive today has been around for the same amount of time, right? Not like Lamarck would have said. And if things look like they're on a ladder, it's because they've evolved in a different way that worked for them, right? Because natural selection is what caused them to evolve. And this ladder is an illusion. It is not real. It's not the right way to think about things, which was another big kind of novelty. The pattern and process of evolution was quickly accepted. Right? There were a lot of people at that time that were just kind of waiting for the right book to be published. The examples were all there. People just didn't have the right way of thinking about it. When The Origin of Species came out, a lot of professional biologists basically looked at the book, read the book, and they were like, it's so obvious. I wish I would have written this book so I could be famous instead of him. However, the natural selection mechanism itself was not immediately accepted by everybody. The fact that things had evolved over time and things were related to each other, accepted. Natural selection being the force responsible for it, not. And some of this is because if you think about our three conditions for evolution, right, variation, heredity, and selection, you can see variation, you can describe variation, which is a big part of what Darwin did in the book. You can see selection and describe selection, right, that all makes sense. Heredity, though, right, this is the 1800s, people didn't have a good understanding of genetics or heredity. This was the missing piece. Later editions of Darwin's book, he kind of tried to put in some heredity, and it was kind of a weird mix of blending inheritance, which isn't true, or pangenesis, which is Lamarck's idea of use and disuse. There was not a good explanation of heredity that Darwin was able to put forward, so this missing piece here meant that during Darwin's lifetime, the evolution part was accepted, the natural selection part was not accepted, and it was still actually being debated all the way through the 1800s, in large part because we didn't have a good understanding of heredity. Now, evolution is accepted within the scientific community now, but there are still two major common misconceptions about evolution that persist to this day that we should have been able to dispense with over 100 years ago. And these are big misconceptions that Darwin's book and theory contrast with. So the first misconception is that individuals pass on acquired traits, some sort of Lamarckianism, where they themselves evolve, right? So maybe food is high up, so organisms like stretch for it so their necks get longer, or they stand on their hind limbs, and they can uh, learn to stand up, and then their offspring will have longer necks or can stand up. There's a lot of people that still kind of think that way, and that's a misconception. Individuals develop or acclimate, right, technical terms, but individuals do not evolve. Evolving is what populations do. 
individuals develop or acclimate, right? When you get a tan, you are acclimating, you are not evolving. And populations evolve by the deaths and births of individuals. They don't kind of all evolve at once with individuals all evolving in concert, right? So how does a population evolve to get darker? It's not all the individuals in the population kind of all getting darker together in one generation. It's that there's a bunch of variation. Some individuals are darker, some individuals are lighter. The darker ones do better. The next generation is a little bit darker. This misconception is still around. But it's one of the major misconceptions that Darwin realized is not true and is a fundamental part of the theory of evolution um, that was then accepted by professional scientists. A second major common misconception that's actually still around is a lot of people think that natural selection acts to improve species with some sort of foresight or goals. This is called teleology, so goal directedness. And this is not true. Natural selection is just choosing between different individuals who happen to be alive today, which ones do better and have more offspring. There's no long-term goal for a species. Natural selection is short-sighted. There's no plan. And that was different, right? Because lots of people thought that there was a plan for this change over time as well. And this misconception shows up. Sometimes people think that mutations happen so that populations can get adaptations. That's not true. Mutations don't happen in order to help populations. Mutations happen all the time. Sometimes they're helpful, sometimes not. They're not happening so that the population can get better. Selection does not see the future and select for what would be best for the population. It acts by choosing from variable individuals in the present. Right? There is not a teleology to evolution. Now a side effect of the selection on individuals, right? some individuals doing better, some individuals doing worse, a side effect of that selection is that the populations in general do adapt and evolve, often but not always becoming kind of improved, right? If it's better to be dark than to be light, and the darker individuals do better than the lighter individuals, the population generation by generation will become darker, and that would cause the population to become better, right? If darker is better than lighter. But that change of the population from being lighter to becoming darker is a side effect of the selection of darker individuals doing better than lighter individuals. And that selection, and we'll see later in this course, that there are some times when selection on individuals can cause a population to change in ways that cause it to not be as good as it would be if that selection had not occurred. OK, so continuing on, now we have much of the theory of evolution accepted, but the mechanism of natural selection not accepted. And this missing piece is heredity. In the late 1800s, we have Gregor Mendel, who you've heard of. He was a monk working in gardens with pea plants. He's the one who did this experiment. You take a bunch of true breeding tall plants, mate them with true breeding short plants. All of the offspring are tall. But when you take those offspring and mate them with each other, you get three to one ratio of tall to short. So from that and similar experiments, he's the one who came up with this idea of particulate inheritance. Right? There are genes with dominant and recessive versions. Everybody has two copies of genes for certain traits. His 1865 paper showed that, but it was basically totally ignored at the time, probably because it had math. And even back then, biologists did not like mathematics. Interestingly, right, there's actually a copy of this paper in Darwin's library, and he failed to understand the importance of it. because. <laughs> He ignored it too, even though it's the missing piece to the fully complete theory of evolution. Also in the late 1800s, we have this guy called Ernst Haeckel. He's studying developmental biology, looking at how things develop from an embryo to a fetus to a baby to an adult. And he's very taken by this evolutionary proposal of Darwin. And so he proposes that ontogeny, that is the development of an individual, recapitulates or redoes their phylogeny, that's their um, history as a species. So he had this idea that organisms, when they develop, they start off as like a fish, and then they develop into an amphibian, and then they develop into a reptile, then they develop into a mammal, and then they develop into whatever type of mammal they're developing into. And that's not what happens. That's not true. But you can see his attempt to kind of try to explain weird things in development by evolution. At the time, this is too vague to be useful, but it's an idea that we're actually going to come back to about 100 years later. So this idea takes about 100 years to become truly productive. But you can see 
an evolutionary idea kind of moving into developmental biology, right? The idea is now spreading into other parts of biology and changing the way that people think. In 1900, Mendel's laws were rediscovered by de Vries, Karenz, and von Tischmark, um, who had thought they had discovered particulate inheritance for the first time, and then they found out that it had been done 35 years earlier. And they're the ones who discover that there are these particulate genes, genes usually of large effect. And in fact, initially, that was really bad for Darwinism, because the mutations that people were discovering had big effects, right? Like the difference between tall pea plants and short pea plants, or the differences between flies that have red eyes or flies that have white eyes. And these genes that these guys were finding, these mutations, they had really big effects. They weren't gradual. They didn't fit with Darwin's uniformitarianism idea, right? So when genes were first discovered and Mendel's laws were rediscovered, mutations were started to be described, it was actually really bad for Darwin's theory of evolution because it didn't fit with the slow, gradual, uniformitarianism type of approach. So in the early 1900s, you have a couple other groups with their own proposals about how evolution worked, right? Everybody agrees things evolve, everybody agrees that things have common ancestry, but what's the force driving that? So mutationists, they didn't believe that selection was responsible at all, they thought there was some sort of mutational drive, that like species were pushed forward by mutations happening over and over again, and that's why they changed. There's another group called the biometricians, this includes a guy called Pearson, who um, you may have heard of from your stats class, from Pearson's R squared. Biometricians used statistics and they studied continuous traits, right? They looked at things like height of people. And when you look at people, there aren't tall people and short people with nothing in between, right? It's like a bell curve of people's heights. So when they looked at traits that people are interested in, they said, well, look, there aren't big differences caused by mutations. They basically said, okay, yeah, you guys can find these mutations and that's all nice and good. And you have some interesting like anecdotal examples but in the real world, these genes that you guys are talking about, they're not important because if they were, we would see you know, tall people, short people, and nobody in between. Instead, we see bell curves. So they actually rejected the idea that these genes were important at all. So in the early 1900s, you have a big crisis for evolution or a big tumult or things are unsettled. Everybody agrees that things have evolved and things are related, and there are closer relatives and more distant relatives. But what's the process? Is it natural selection like Darwin said? Or is it some sort of mutational drive like these guys said? Or is it something else because genes aren't important like these guys said? It's a big mess. In the early 1900s, nobody really is settled on what the process is. Is it natural selection, or is it something else that's causing things to evolve over time? Then we get to World War I. So World War I, this guy gets assassinated. And because all these European countries have various pacts with each other, one little conflict leads all of Europe to go to war with each other. So we don't really have a lot of science going on because people are digging trenches and killing each other instead. 